It is 10 a.m. in Kiev, 5 p.m. in Sydney, and 4 on a Friday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gwan Young. This is Arirang, Korea's only global network. A team of South Korean investigators strongly believes the three drones recently found crashed in different parts of the South came from North Korea. To confirm and reinforce their findings, they now turn to a team of GPS experts. Choi Yusun has our top story. The investigative team has found a sizable amount of circumstantial evidence from the aerial vehicle's characteristics and loaded equipment that confirms the drones were sent by North Korea. On Friday, the South Korean government revealed what it knows so far about the three unmanned aerial vehicles found crashed in Paju, north of Seoul, on the western island of Pengyongdo and in Samcheok, Gangwon-do province. The defense ministry said identification information on the parts used inside the drone's engines, cameras and computer chips appear to have been intentionally damaged, another factor that points the finger at Pyongyang. The other evidence that implicates the North are the color and shape of the fuselages. They were very similar to the one seen during North Korean founder Kim Il-sung's birthday parade two years ago. Investigators, however, failed to decode the GPS coordinates for the drone's point of return as they were concerned about damaging the information stored inside the central processing unit. A separate team of civilian experts from the South and the United States will probe the GPS system. The scientific investigative team will mobilize all efforts to find further evidence. This includes determining the drone's point of takeoff by analyzing the photos, the data stored in the central processing unit as well as their travel routes. The defense ministry said the vehicles seem to have traveled above military zones in the south and took bird's eye view photos of western islands and the capital region, including the presidential office. If the final results confirm the drones to be from North Korea, Seoul says it will consider it a violation of the armistice agreement and take strong measures at the international level. Che Yusun, Arirang News. Now moving all over to the international community's efforts to counter the ongoing threat posed by North Korea, a U.N. sanctions committee has been mulling over ways to punish Pyongyang for its recent ballistic missile launches that destabilized the region. Now this as the defense chiefs of South Korea and the United States picked up the phone to coordinate their North Korea policies. Our Shin Se-min has the details. A clear violation of U.N. resolutions. That was the conclusion that the U.N.'s North Korea Sanctions Committee came to during an emergency meeting on Thursday local time. The meeting was a first since Pyongyang launched two mid-range ballistic missiles late last month, and U.N. sources say the panel agreed to come up with countermeasures to deal with the threat. As for when, the sources say the committee will wait until May to hold further talks after a report from a North Korean specialist is finalized. To no one's surprise, South Korea, the U.S., Britain and France supported the statement, while China and Russia were more cautious, saying the wider issue of securing peace and stability on the Korean peninsula was a most pressing concern. A day before the committee meeting, South Korean Defense Minister Kim Gwan Jin received a phone call from his U.S. counterpart Chuck Hagel, with both agreeing to work hand-in-hand -hand to counter threats posed by Pyongyang. During their 20-minute phone conversation, the two agreed that Pyongyang's missile and nuclear weapons pose a grave challenge to the Korean Peninsula and international community. Hegel also informed Kim of Washington's plan to dispatch two additional ages equipped destroyers to Japan by 2017 to counter the North Korea threat. Also on Thursday, a former U.S. nonproliferation official said the international community should step up its efforts for targeted sanctions on the North Korean leadership. Speaking at a forum hosted by the 38 North website, Joseph de Thomas said it was important to find mechanisms that go after the North Korean regime and not its people. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. There is a fresh wave of optimism that the key members of the six-way talks on North Korea's denuclearization will make some compromises and agree to resume dialogue in the future. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang Sung Hee reports on the back-to-back -back meetings between these key players. Diplomatic activity is picking up speed to try and jumpstart the long-stalled six-party nuclear talks. 
South Korean chief nuclear envoy Hwang Jung-guk is in Beijing Friday for talks with his Chinese counterpart U Dawei, following a trilateral meeting with the United States and Japan in Washington earlier this week. South Korea and China will discuss issues related to North Korea's nuclear program, including ways to resume the denuclearization talks. The Chinese envoy will reportedly travel to Washington soon for talks with the U.S. chief nuclear envoy, Glenn Davies. Wu is expected to debrief South Korea and the U.S. on the results of his visit to Pyongyang last month and step up efforts to bring back North Korea to the six-party talks. The multilateral denuclearization dialogue involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, has been stalled since late 2008, but anticipation about a possible resumption is growing. Following their three-way meeting, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo said they will consider more flexibility in bringing Pyongyang back to the negotiating table. The three parties have been demanding North Korea's denuclearization as a precondition to restarting the aid for disarmament talks. South Korea's unification ministry said the North may also be ready to talk things out. In its analysis of North Korea's recent Spring People's Assembly session, the ministry noted the leadership appears to have set its power structure and pointed to the possibility of the regime pursuing the resumption of the talks more aggressively down the road. Hwang sang Arirang News. Well, in the face of mounting threats from North Korea, the air forces of South Korea and the United States begin their largest ever air drills this Friday. For the next two weeks, the Allies will engage in war simulations to boost their combat readiness. Here's our Kim min -ji with a preview. South Korea and the United States kick off their biannual Max Thunder exercise on this Friday. The two weeks of air drills will be the largest ever, mobilizing 103 warplanes and some 1,400 pilots, with Korea's Air Force deploying some 50 warplanes, including F-15K and KF-16 fighters. During the maneuvers, the Allies will engage in war simulation exercises. They will focus on realistic training involving precision attacks on enemy forces, disabling air defense systems and executing supply missions for troops infiltrating bases in hostile territory. An Air Force official said the air drills will bolster their joint combat readiness at a time of heightened tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Three drones believed to be from North Korea have been discovered in the south in recent weeks. Pyongyang has also fired off a series of ballistic missiles and rockets and threatens to conduct a new form of nuclear test. Separately, South Korea and the U.S. are still holding annual Key Resolve and Fall Eagle exercises, which will run until April 18th. Kim min -ji, Airang News. <laughs> When the latest news meets the latest business stories, we give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Business Today with Moon Gon Yong, every weekday, only on Arirang. Now, here in Korea, a woman who beat her eight-year-old stepdaughter to death was sentenced this Friday. And despite the brutal and heinous nature of the crime, she will spend just 10 years behind bars. Well, the case has sparked public outcry and has prompted politicians here in the nation to take extreme measures to tackle child abuse. Connie Lee has more. It was in this home in Gyeongsangbuk-do province where an eight-year-old girl was fatally beaten to death by her stepmother. Punched and kicked repeatedly, the girl died from a ruptured intestine last August. Her stepmother, identified only by her surname Im, and her husband went on trial this Friday morning. And despite prosecutors asking for a 20-year jail sentence for the stepmother, she was sentenced to 10 years by the judge on Friday. The father in this case was given a three-year term for negligence, despite prosecutors asking for seven years of jail time. Officials say the stepmother not only beat her youngest stepdaughter to death, but also forced her older stepdaughter to testify that she killed her younger sister. Public outrage surrounding the case grew even more when a letter written by the victim's 12-year-old sister claimed the stepmother had put her inside a laundry machine and let it run. 
Meanwhile, on the heels of Friday's trial, the Ministry of Health and Welfare released data that shows 97 children died from parental abuse from 2001 to 2012. The report, however, also notes that the number of deaths is probably higher as many cases go unreported. In light of this case and other high-profile child abuse cases in Korea, the government is also taking action, with policymakers and ruling party lawmakers looking for ways to put an end to child abuse. Connie Lee, Arirang News. A 15-year-long legal battle between smokers and Korea's biggest tobacco company, KTNG, came to an end on Thursday, but it's not the end of the war. The newest entrant is the National Health Insurance Service, which is expected to fire a fire first shot as early as next week. Our Kwon Tua has this report. It's just the beginning. Although Korea's biggest tobacco company, KTNG, has won its legal battle against seven cancer patients, another round of trials may just be around the corner. This time, however, the plaintiffs are not individuals, but a public organization, the National Health Insurance Service. It announced in December that it will sue KTNG, as well as Philip Morris and British American Tobacco Korea, to recover medical costs incurred due to tobacco-related illnesses. The organization said the Supreme Court's verdict Thursday has not changed its plans for the upcoming lawsuit and that they are confident about their case. The Health Insurance Service has analyzed the cause and effect relationship between smoking and cancer through a 19-year-long study and has compiled a massive database of related cases. The agency claims that cancer occurrence in smokers is much higher than in non-smokers and that this has resulted in much higher diagnosis rates and treatment costs. It's asking for around $54 million of damages. Legal experts say if the organization submits new evidence, they may have a better chance at winning. If the National Health Insurance Service focuses on issues like unfair profits, instead of just suing the cigarette company for breaking the law, the new approach to the issue could lead to a much fiercer battle. When asked about their stance on the Supreme Court's ruling on Thursday, the health insurance agency said they were not surprised by the result and that they were not affected. The National Health Insurance Service could file its complaint as early as Monday. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Now, authorities searching for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 in the Indian Ocean believe they are on the right track. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott told reporters in China that he was very confident that the underwater pings recently detected are from the plane's black box. Abbott did say, though, that the signal is starting to fade and that it's crucial to recover the black box before its battery runs out. That was just about all Abbott said on the issue, adding that he did not want to reveal too much until he had had the opportunity to update the Chinese leadership later in the day. The Korean won ended higher against the dollar on this Friday to post its biggest weekly percentage gain in more than two years. Now, this and continued foreign buying in local shares in dollar sales by exporters. The Korean won was quoted at 1,035 won against the U.S. dollar at the end of onshore trade, up one half a percent from Thursday's closing at 1040. That is up 1.8 percent from a week ago, the best since early December 2011. Now on the trading floor, Seoul's benchmark cost be ended down a six tenths of a percent to close the day and this week at 1997, although foreign investors extended their net buying spree into a 13th session. The tech heavy cause deck finished up more than 0.1 percent. Growth may be the answer to most things in terms of the economy, but the World Bank says it's just not enough when it comes to ending global poverty. The World Bank said in a report Thursday that while economic growth remains a good way to reduce poverty, it does have its limits. 
The report is urging developing economies to enhance growth with policies that allocate more resources to the extreme poor by promoting more inclusive growth or through government programs. Well, World Bank President Jim Yong Kim said the number of people earning less than $1.25 a day will have to decrease by 50 million each year if the bank is to reach its goal of eradicating extreme poverty by 2030. Now, from now on, new smartphone models released here in Korea will need to come equipped with anti-theft features. Korea Science Ministry is requiring smartphone makers to include so-called kill switches that enable owners to suspend all functions and restrict access if their device goes missing. Samsung Electronics' new Galaxy S5 model is equipped with that feature, and LG Electronics says its new models to be released this year will have that software. Around 1.2 million smartphones were lost last year, and more than 3,000 units were smuggled out of the country in 2012, which is three times higher than the previous year. And like we just mentioned, it is vitally important to trust the place in which you keep your hard-earned cash, but in Korea these days, trusting banks, credit card firms, and other financial institutions is in very short supply. In what is just the latest in a wave of leaks, the personal information of tens of thousands of customers has been stolen from three local credit card companies. Our Hwang ji hae has the details. Yet another huge credit card company in Korea has failed to protect its clients' personal information. Financial sources said Friday that the data of some 35,000 Shinan card customers has been leaked. The information includes credit card numbers and passwords for the company's loyalty cards. Since many clients use the same passwords for their credit and loyalty cards, this data breach has the potential to lead to mass credit card fraud. This latest discovery came as the Financial Supervisory Service looked into a recent case in which a gang hacked into a private server and stole information on credit card transactions. Aside from Shinhan, the personal information of more than 60,000 customers from companies like Kungmin Card and Nongyap Card was compromised. That takes the total number of people that had their information used by the ring to around 100,000. Local financial authorities on the same day opened a meeting where they ordered credit card firms to adopt integrated circuit or IC cards by the end of the year. IC cards are considered to be more secure than traditional magnetic stripe cards. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, Korean stocks have been up and down in recent days and mostly on external factors. And the Korean won jumping and value touching six-year highs. Let's take a closer look at the financial market here in Seoul. We have Dr. Kim byung Ju, the head of KLMP Consulting, and of course our regular commentator on this program. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. Now, uh, yesterday we saw the cost be uh, ending over or going over the 2000 mark right. in intraday trading for the first time this year. Of course, today mm -hmm. it ended uh, the week at 1997. Right. And uh, last time the index reached the point above 2000 was uh, last year, December 30, 30th, right? right? right. Uh, should we be excited about this or reserved? Uh, not today, I suppose. I mean, today was not a bad day at all because uh, just uh, the index itself went down like 2.5 point, 2.5 uh, just below 2,000. Uh, when the trading began today, there was a big sell-off because of the uh, drop in New York market last right. night. And a lot of people were just selling. Even the foreign investors were selling big time. But however, as the time went by, especially after, well, leading up to the uh, lunchtime, I think foreigners were net selling about 20 billion uh, one worth. But after that, in the afternoon, uh, you know, the foreign investors turned around and they began buying. So the overall, the index uh, went up, or not all the way to 2000, but still went up. And then uh, foreign investors ended up uh, net buying for the day. And this is like a 13 continuous trading day of net buying by the uh, foreign investors here, which actually causes uh, or drives a lot of uh, analysts uh, speculating whether this means a some kind of new 
uh, upturn for Korean market. Once again, coming back again, you know, all the speculation of whether Korean market itself is very different and needs to be differentiated among uh, different markets around the world, all that. Uh, these days, we hear the money is flowing into Korea, Brazil, and Taiwan mm -hmm. big time. And so a lot of people are wondering, indeed, whether this is a long-term trend or not. Uh, Monday alone, net uh, buying by the foreign investors marked 1.7 trillion won. That was big time, biggest ever one day net buying. Mm -hmm. So does this mean some kind of starting of, a, uh, starting of a new upturn or not? I think we need at least a few more days to figure that out. Well, the uh, foreign investors in net buying, the buying spree, is that what's driving up the value of the Korean won? I mean, today it yeah. ended at a, uh, it posted its biggest weekly percentage gain in more than two years, and right. of course posted uh, the best week in 28 months at right, 1,035 right. won, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very, uh, you know, a big value. Mm -hmm. So is that why the reason behind it? Right. There's no question that uh, foreign buyers of Korean stocks are the main force these days driving up the value. Value of Korean won, and as you mentioned, 1,035 won per dollar itself. It, this is a very, very high. Uh, actually, yesterday it reached 1,031 won per dollar. That was the highest in five years and eight months. So a lot of people were quite uh, surprised, and, you know, in, in terms of this pace of uh, one appreciation altogether. And that's why yesterday, quite interestingly, a uh, new bank of governor of Central Bank. Uh, uh, Mr. Lee yeah. Israel came in actually verb with verbal intervention in his very first press conference. He mm -hmm. said uh, the central bank will be closely watching the movement of the Korean one's appreciation and when there are signs actually there is appreciation uh, going excessive manner uh, the central bank will proactively intervene and so that was a very strong word from a new governor in his very first press conference and I think market reacted to that right after his words uh, you know all of a sudden the appreciation pace of the day yesterday kind of like weakened down and so things were fine and but uh, today once again the appreciation trend continues and a lot of people are wondering whether this is a uh, some kind of a longer term deal as I mentioned uh, foreign money is flowing into Korean market, Brazilian market, and Taiwanese market. And what's happening is, as a result of that, many analysts here in Korea, foreign analysts uh, working in Korea, are actually making a prediction that sometime soon we could possibly see 1,000 won per dollar. And some radicals are even saying maybe 900, uh, 951 per dollar may be possibility even in a short term. Uh, I, my own view is that's a, too much of a wild prediction, but still, it's important to note that in the market, there are people who seem to be having this kind of uh, radical belief. So I should uh, put some time off in buying dollars for now. Uh, right, uh, one right. of the reasons of the rate freeze yesterday by the central bank meeting, mm -hmm. was it the strong one? Yeah, indeed. Uh, you cannot afford to increase the interest rate when the, your currency is appreciating. So uh, rate increase itself was not an option. And rate decrease, that was not an option either because Governor Lee uh, acknowledged that overall the improvement of the economy is continuing and he was not revising the outlook, positive outlook for the economy. There are some people may be wondering, I mean, Bank of Korea has uh, changed its number for uh, this year's outlook for this year's growth from 3.8 percent to 4 percent. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they really didn't change much. What they changed was just technical details that composes the calculation of uh, the outlook itself. They added new things in terms of like a, a basket of a calculation and all that. So there's no change, substantial change between the old number of 3.8 percent to 4 percent. But bank was, uh, you know, maintaining its overall positive outlook for this year. That's why they kept the rate in place, especially considering the appreciation trend and the overall outlook uh, altogether. Well, uh, relating back to the strong won, mm -hmm. um, how are Korean companies weathering this? I mean, uh, by now they should have some experience in dealing with, with such a such challenge, right? Interesting thing is never an ex enough experience for small and medium industries. Mm. Uh, you know, small companies always suffer when there's right, an right. appreciation, that's for sure. But Korea's big companies like Samsung and Hyundai, they got a big lesson and uh, big training during the 2007, 2008, uh, you know, the turmoils and challenges. Remember, like uh, at the beginning of, uh, the, at the end of 2007 or so, Korea's, uh, Korean won's exchange rate was about 900 won per a dollar. Mm -hmm. That was an extremely high level. 
And so that's uh, when these big names were suffering big time and they learned lessons. And Samsung Electronics and the Hyundai Motors, they came up with their own strategies of dealing with these kind of challenges. Samsung's case, uh, radical cut down of their production cost for one, and then uh, Hyundai uh, Motors, uh, radical shift of production overseas. So they got used to it and I think they're in a good shape right at this point. Well, market fluctuations definitely something that we will have to keep our eyes on sure. closely for the next few weeks. Right. All right, Dr. Kim Young Ju, thank you so much for today and all of this week, and we will see you next Monday. Okay. Happy Friday and good afternoon. The warm weather continues here in the nation with highs reaching up to 25 degrees in some regions. Now, with temperatures reading uh, going up, there are some things to remember. Now, we tend to get drowsier as it heats up and seafood is actually a good way to give yourself a pick-me-up. So if you're already feeling tired, uh, keep that in mind. Now, for more details, let's shift over to our satellite map. As you can see, it's partly cloudy over the nation and a sign of things to come in this weekend when showers are forecast. Now, going over to our temperature readings. Seoul tops out at 20 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will peak up to 23 and 18 degrees. Now, moving over to other regions, Jeju Island peaks to 20, while Mount Kumgang tops out at 8. Well, that's all for now. Michelle Park, and back to you, Kanyang. Thank you, Michelle, for that, and that's all from me at this hour. Thank you for watching, and check back in again at 6 p.m. Korea time for Early Edition at 6.